für die Ernte. Nobody knows for certain where Sandy Koufax was on this day 50 years ago. But all of us know where he wasn't. It was game one of the Dodgers Twins World Series and Koufax was due to pitch against Minnesota's Mudcat Grant. The game did not go well. Don's for the Dodgers. Don Drysdale, the big D, started in Sandy's place and was getting hammered. As the story goes, when manager Walter Alston came to the mound to pull him from the game, Drysdale said, hey Skip, bet you wish I was Jewish today too. <laughs> Post break fast, Sandy would start and lose the second game. Thankfully, once back in Los Angeles, the Dodgers would win three straight on very little rest Sandy started the seventh game pitching a spectacular three-hit, ten-strikeout shutout, completing the game, winning the series, and forever changing American Jewish identity. Nobody knows where Sandy was that day except, of course, for Sandy. As Jane Levy shares in her terrific book on Koufax, like Elijah at the Seder table, he was seen by rabbis and Jews in synagogues everywhere, from the Twin Cities to Los Angeles. Hoping for an answer, I myself reached out to him with an invitation to visit us on the holidays. And he left an incredibly kind and gracious message of regret on my voicemail that I will never erase. More difficult it would seem to get an audience with Koufax than with the Pope. <laughs> While Koufax himself may not be in our shul today, <laughs> I'm delighted to report that his rookie uniform is on display in our lobby by way of the generosity of George Blumenthal and the American Jewish Historical Society. Over the course of Yom Kippur, I invite you to take it in in the lobby a garment by which to appreciate, in the immortal words of John Goodman in The Big Lebowski, 3,000 years of beautiful tradition from Moses to Sandy Koufax. <laughs> the more I study that momentous day, the more convinced I am that far more noteworthy than Koufax's choice not to pitch is the mythology that came to be associated with the decision. Long before Koufax, in 1934, Hank, the Hebrew hammer Greenberg, had sat out a Yom Kippur series game. For 10 years prior to that day in 65, Koufax hadn't pitched on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, the Dodger organization planning the pitching rotation around his faith, a fan having once sent Walter Alston a Jewish calendar to consult with when setting the starting rotation. <laughs> For both Koufax and his teammates, the decision wasn't so momentous. It was just a flip in the pitching rotation. Koufax would, after all, go on to pitch three more games in the series. In fact, while proud of his Jewish heritage, Sandy never claimed to be a devout or practicing Jew, nor did he ever seek to draw attention to his faith as had Cassius Clay when he changed his name to Muhammad Ali the year prior. In the following years, Koufax would express wonderment at the mythological status that came to surround a decision that was, in his mind, no big deal. As he reflected in his biography published shortly thereafter, there was never any decision to make because there was never any possibility that I would pitch. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the Jewish religion. The club knows that I don't work that day. And if this is the case, if more important than the decision itself is the mythology that came to surround it, then the real question we need to address is not so much about Koufax, but about us. Koufax's decision not to pitch was the most impactful non-event to shape Jewish identity, perhaps since Barbara Streisand decided not to change her nose. 
in the same way that the Six-Day War reframed Israel's self-understanding, in the same way that the Eichmann trial transformed post-Holocaust Jewry, that one day, 50 years ago today, was a pivot forever changing American Jewish identity. The question is not, why did Koufax sit out? But rather, why do we care so much that he did? Why did his decision achieve the fabled status that it has? I think the answer, to a certain degree, can be boiled down to a popular bumper sticker of the era, which read, you don't have to be Jewish to love Sandy. Koufax was, by any definition, a sports superstar, loved by Jew and non-Jew alike. A month before that Yom Kippur, he had pitched a perfect game. He was leading the league in wins, strikeouts, and ERA, and it was on his way to capturing his second unanimous Cy Young Award. I'll explain what this all means after. <laughs> He does the Aramaic, I do this. <laughs> Koufax had, by way of his unique athletic ability, risen to a rarefied stratosphere of American celebrity, and then chose, as it were, to remain chosen, to not compromise his religious convictions. According to cultural historian David Kaufman, acculturating Jews of the 1950s and 60s remained shy about public Jewish identification, anxious about being perceived as too Jewish. Koufax's refusal to pitch gave Jews a collective kickstart, stimulating their dormant sense of Jewishness. Important as Greenberg's decision not to play 30 years before, his generation had yet to taste the assimilating possibilities and anxieties of Koufax's time. Koufax's unspoken and reflexive avowal of his Judaism at the height of his game was the kvel that was heard around the Jewish world. He showed American Jewry that you could live in two cultures, you could make it big in America and remain a nice Jewish boy. He was the embodiment of masculinity and menschlichkeit. Every boy wanted to be him and every girl wanted to be loved by him. Koufax was not an American Jew or a Jewish American. He was both, or more specifically, he was the hyphen that bridged the two. The power of the Koufax myth for American Jewry is that he came to represent an ideal. He was the hyphenated dream of American Jewry. It's 50 years later today. And as with every Yom Kippur, today we reflect on the kind of people and the kind of Jews we want to be in the year and the years ahead. As modern Jews, we know that both our blessing and our challenge is that there are many models to choose from. In the wake of the Enlightenment and Emancipation, when the Jewish community left the shtetl, it was the first time that we were extended the choice of how we wanted to be Jews, if at all. There were many, not surprisingly, who left the fold entirely, changing their names and their faith, hoping to become citizens of a common humanity, untethered from the Jewish people forever. On the other end of the spectrum, there were those who shunned secular culture and all that came with it. In 1839, the Chatam Sofer, Moses Sofer, in his last will and testament, asked that his children remain shalem, Shin Lamed Mem, an acronym for not changing their Shemot, their names, their Lashon, their language, and their Malbush, their dress. Only by maintaining their distinctiveness could the forces of assimilation be withstood and the Jewish future assured. In between these options, there were many others, most famously the suggested split attributed to Moses Mendelssohn to be a Jew in the home and a man in the street, a bifurcation between the public and the private spheres of our lives. Of course, the most famous reaction to the solving the riddle of how to balance our Jewish and our secular identities is, 
Zionism. This was at its core the Jewish question that Herzl sought to solve in the late 1800s. How can a Jew be both loyal to her heritage and a citizen of the world? His answer, political Zionism, contending that the only viable answer was for a Jew to be a citizen of the Jewish state. There are, to be sure, many answers to the question, but at risk of stating the obvious, if you're sitting here in this room, you have chosen not to live in Israel, nor have you chosen to live in a Hasidic enclave of Munsi or Kiryat Yovel, nor for that matter have you opted out of Jewish life. Had you have done so, you wouldn't be sitting in this room. You've chosen, we've chosen, to live our lives, our children's and our grandchildren, on the foundation of that razor-thin hyphen we call American Jewish identity. We are the people, as described by Rabbi Abraham Heschel, who live within the language and culture of a 20th century nation, are exposed to its challenge, its doubts, and its allurements, and at the same time insist upon the preservation of Jewish authenticity. In pre-war Germany, this was best expressed by the philosopher Franz Rosenzweig, who employed the term Zweistromland, a land of two rivers, whereby the Jew resides on the banks of two cultures, that of the world and that of Judaism, a dual allegiance that preserves a Jew's integrity as both a Jew and a citizen of the world. To live with a hyphenated identity is not unique to American Jews. Most famously, Du Bois wrote of the double consciousness of his community, to feel two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings in one body. In the American Jewish context, this ideal was best expressed by Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, who wrote that the American Jew should live simultaneously in two civilizations. American Jews are heirs to a twofold spiritual patrimony, American and Jewish. We must be loyal to both. We must protect both, and we must balance the two on the fulcrum of the hyphen at the core of our identities. To live with a hyphenated identity is a delicate juggling act, a dynamic and sometimes disorienting struggle to integrate our multiple selves. Sometimes it tips one way and sometimes it tips the other. I'm reminded of the exchange between Henry Kissinger and Golda Meir when Kissinger informed the Prime Minister that he was first an American and then a Jew, to which she replied, that's fine, because in Israel we read from right to left. <laughs> You'll not be surprised to know that growing up, baseball was everything to me. You'll also not be surprised to hear that in my household growing up, it was understood that you went to synagogue every week. I have distinct memories of walking into shul, waking after waking up early for a game, changing in the synagogue bathroom, and bowing down at the end of services for Alenu, hoping that nobody saw my baseball stirrups poking out from under my suit. More importantly, I remember my father, who to this very day will wake up early on a Shabbat morning to see his patients before he goes to shul. I think of my older brother, who despite the fact that 30 years later, the Who is still playing in Madison Square Garden, he remains traumatized by my parents' refusal to let him attend their final farewell concert because it fell on Shabbat. I also remember that when my older brother, the one who was actually good at baseball, made state championships, not only did he play on a Friday night, but every member of our family was there to cheer him on. I could give you a million examples. Sometimes it tipped one way, sometimes it tipped the other way, and sometimes some third weird way emerged that sought to awkwardly reconcile our Jewish and our secular selves. But no matter what the outcome, the understanding in our household was that every decision was going to be processed by way of that hyphen. My brothers and I all lead very different lives and we all married wives with very different religious sensibilities. But it's that same hyphen that sits at the core of all of our identities. It is a prism by which we negotiate who we are in this world, spiritually, 
communally, financially, and otherwise. My fear, in a sentence, is that we are losing our ability to articulate that hyphen. We may know what it means to be an American. We may even know what it means to be a Jew. But we've forgotten that the essence of who we are is not one or the other, but both. We're failing to communicate the ideal, to model it for our children, and pass it down from one generation to the next. The recent Pew study of American Jewry revealed the demographic shifts taking place in the Jewish community and the faith community as a whole. A rightward shift towards tradition, a leftward shift towards secularism, and a collapse of the vital religious center. Jews, amongst other faith traditions, have been led to believe that the choice is either or, forgetting that the ideal, as best expressed by conservative Judaism, is that our two identities are meant to inform each other, a Judaism shaped by the contemporary context, a contemporary context shaped by our Jewish identity. This is the secret sauce of the project called American Judaism, and it's a project, my friends, whose future is in serious jeopardy. Long, day, long gone are the days when a rabbi will stand in front of a congregation and tell everyone to keep kosher or Shabbat or make Aliyah to Israel. You recall the story of the young rabbi who was interviewing for a pulpit and he was being prepped by the chairman for his sermon. The rabbi indicated he intended to talk about the importance of Shabbat, to which the chairman advised, no, 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 I'd stay away from that. Many of our congregants don't keep kosher. You're gonna alienate them. The young rabbi responded, maybe a better topic might be the importance of Shabbat, to which the chairman said, no, 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 definitely stay away from Shabbat. Our community has a wide range of practice and God forbid you should make everyone feel uncomfortable. If not Shabbat, if not Kashrut, the young rabbi asked, then what should I talk about? You know, said the chairman, talk to them about Judaism. <laughs> I'm not gonna preach to you about any single mitzvah, Shabbat, Kashrut, or otherwise. But I am gonna challenge you. I am gonna make you feel a bit uncomfortable. Because if there is one question I want to simmer in your soul over this Yom Kippur, one act of spiritual inventory in which I want you to engage, it is to squarely confront the hyphen of your identity. More than any single practice you can pass down to your children and grandchildren, ask yourself, check yourself, if you are communicating the dynamic tension of what it means to be an American Jew, the tension upon which our future depends. <laughs> One of the biggest decisions my wife and I had to make this year was whether our teenage daughter was gonna go to a Jewish or a secular high school. We had multiple, long, honest conversations about it. Not just between me and my wife, but with our daughter as well. So she understood the full implications of her decision. Another one of my kids is a very talented gymnast. Talented enough that this year she'll have meets that meet on Shabbat. And I can't tell you how it's gonna shake out, but I can tell you that there will be a lot of tears in our household, on all sides, as we negotiate and navigate the decision. Your children, I know, have ballet and tennis and piano and all sorts of commitments that conflict with Hebrew school. It isn't easy, believe you me, I know. But if your only response is to call the synagogue with the news that you're pulling your kid from Hebrew school, you may well succeed in having a private bar bat mitzvah somewhere, but you will have failed to teach your child what it means to live with a hyphenated identity. The message your child will internalize is that the Jewish community is something to do when it is convenient, but when it conflicts with another commitment, we create a workaround. Our children pick up on our cues. They know what's going on, or when you drop them off for Hebrew school but fail to walk in yourself. More often than not, it's our nonverbal choices that communicate the biggest message of all. 
of the four children at the Seder table, the most interesting by far is the second child, the one who asks his parents, what does this service mean to you? The child isn't wicked. His question is the honest one. Because if we can't provide an answer to our child in our own words, in our own deeds, as to what being Jewish means to us, then how in the world can we expect our children to construct an answer for themselves? If you have fallen in love with someone who is not Jewish, whether or not that person converts, and you have not communicated that your shared love must go hand in hand with a commitment to Jewish life and tradition, then you have failed to articulate that hyphen. If your name is displayed on a cultural institution, research center, or college scholarship, but not an institution aimed at perpetuating Jewish life, then you have failed to communicate that hyphen. If you can sing, take me out to the ball game, but not the first paragraph of the Shema, then you failed to articulate that hyphen. If you've gone zip lining to Costa Rica, but have never dipped in Israel's Dead Sea, you failed to articulate the hyphen. If you have season tickets to the theater, but you have failed to sign up for a class lecture or concert in the synagogue, you have failed to articulate the hyphen. If you're happy to have a Seder in your own home, but you just can't bring yourself to bring matzah and cream cheese to work over Passover, you have failed to articulate that hyphen. To be an American Jew isn't easy. It's advanced citizenship. But it means that being Jewish makes a claim on your identity, and that claim affects the choices you make in the public sphere and the private sphere, how you spend your time and resources, how you determine your level of observance, and the educational decisions you'll make for your children and grandchildren. There's no single algorithm. Each one of us needs to figure out for ourselves. But we all need to engage in the struggle if we want to restore the dream of the hyphen to American Jewish life, then we need to reinforce the intensity of the Jewish lives we lead. We may rise or fall, we may succeed or fail, but let's do ourselves and the Jewish future the dignity of knowing that we were honest with ourselves and we left it all out on the field. If you know a little bit about Sandy Koufax, then you know that he grew up as a very close friend to another Jewish New Yorker of note, a New Yorker who, God bless, is having a fabulous year, the owner of the Mets, Fred Wilpon. <laughs> In my research on Koufax, I discovered a kernel of a story about Wilpon that I think teaches us much today, and maybe way back when taught something to his friend Koufax as well. As the story goes, back in the day in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, no matter what your background, Irish, Italian, or Jewish, the best baseball was played through the Catholic Youth Organization based out of St. Donatius on Bay Parkway between 61st and 62nd. The league was run by a wonderful young priest, Father John Fleming, who served his community with distinction until he was called to Rome in 63. One day, out of the blue, Fred's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Nathan Wilpon, received a phone call from the parish office informing them that Father Fleming would like to pay them a visit. You can imagine their combination of curiosity and anxiety at playing host to the communal religious leader, and Fran Wilpon nervously baked cookies in anticipation of the visit. Father Fleming, it turns out, came by to express regret to the Jewish family that the championship game would be played that year on the High Holidays. Now, although I have it on good authority that Nat and Fram of blessed memory would have never let Fred play on the holidays, Father Fleming communicated that he understood Fred's conflict and he suggested to the family that he not play. A Jew, Father Fleming reasoned, should always be proud of his faith and for him, to not play would send a message to all the boys in the neighborhood, Jewish and non-Jewish, on what it means to be proud of your heritage. Affirming how he was raised, young Fred took Father Fleming's advice to heart, and he didn't play, though I think we can all agree that his baseball career turned out just fine. 
Is there a direct link from Father Fleming to Fred Wilpon to Sandy Koufax's decision years later? I don't know. What I do know are three things. First, I know that there was once a time when a Catholic priest helped teach a Jewish kid that to be a Jew means that you have to be ready to affirm your faith even when it conflicts with another aspect of your being. Second, I know that a few years later, 50 years ago today, Sandy Koufax taught American Jews that it is possible to live in two worlds. The hyphenated dream of American Jewish identity can be ours if we embrace it to strive to do so. Finally, I know that 50 years henceforth, the unprecedented freedoms we enjoy as American Jews, freedoms that have been a source of extraordinary blessing, have also presented an unprecedented challenge to the dynamic tension of what it means to be an American Jew. It will not be any priest, or for that matter, any rabbi, who will determine whether our generation successfully articulates the hyphen within. It will be up to each of you, each and every one of you, to struggle to find that balance and to model that struggle for our children, our grandchildren, and beyond. May we succeed in our task, and may the dream of American Jewry be renewed for generations to come. Amen.